Thank you for that. Good morning, everyone. Come with me on a fleeting visit to my time in uni when I was 18. One day, I heard my name called. Hey, PKP, can you run? Yes, Father Leeming, why do you ask? I, the college sports day is coming up and I'm gathering the names of those who want to compete. Which events shall I put you down for? Well, put me down for the mile, Father. And the half mile. He scribbled my name on his sheet and he rushed off, too busy to question the wisdom of running both events on the same day. As for me, I promptly forgot all about sports day at Calcutta University's St. Xavier's College until a couple of days before the event. And what happened next resulted in an important lesson that I learned and which I'd like to share with you in a little while. But come with me first along the path to the creation of a keynote speech and let me share my screen with you. Now, if you can see my slides, see if you can grab the, the, the right-hand edge of my slides and drag along to about the middle of your screen. Okay, and then you can see um, us on the right-hand side, or I'll move it up to the top there. Right, okay, now, a keynote speech sets the theme for an event. It provides an inspirational, uplifting message that brings about some significant change in the listener. The story of my sports day at uni will play a part. Let's call the speech Because I Tried. And let me talk about the three essential uh, considerations in preparing such a speech. But first, why is it Because I Tried? Because it's my story. I have tried, and this is what I've learned along the way. And maybe I can save you a little time. So what are the three vital considerations that I mentioned? There are the three M's, message, messenger, and method. As you can see, I was blonde in those days. The first M is your message. It's not the subject matter of your speech. It's the significance of what you're talking about. It's what you want people to remember about your speech. A lot of people miss this step and they just focus on the factual content and the speech falls flat. The second M stands for messenger, that's you. Why do people need to hear your message from you and not from someone else? It could be your angle on the topic or it could be something that belongs to you, something that you believe in and really want people to hear. And the third M is method. You must develop the techniques, the skills to put across your message effectively and the right structure. So let's start with message. What should you talk about? Obviously, it should be something you know about and care about, and I'm going to offer you six elements to help you to focus on getting an emotional response to your message. It's one of the three pillars of oratory. As you know, the ancient Greeks gave us the traditional pillars of oratory, which are ethos, logos, and pathos. Ethos is about your credentials, logos is your logic and reasoning, and pathos is about whatever appeals to the emotions. It's what persuades, persuades people to buy into your message. And I consider pathos to be the most important element because without an emotional connection, your speech may be admired, but it'll achieve nothing. Now, in ancient Greece, there were two outstanding orators who campaigned for Athenian independence against Philip of Macedon, and they were called Iskines and Demosthenes. They had very different styles of speaking. When Iskines spoke, people said, how well he spoke. But when Demosthenes spoke, they said, let's march! What kind of response would you like to your speeches? Now, I'm going to use pathos as an acronym for the six elements to prompt you to say something meaning meaningful and to get buy-in to your message. Now, any one of them, or any combination of them, and the stories that I use to illustrate them may prompt you to find your own stories and draw your own lessons from them. 
all the stories that I use will align with my theme because I tried. And you may notice that they're all about different kinds of endeavor. Now, the P in pathos stands for purpose. It's the focus of, of whatever you want to talk about. Now, I was struck by a quote from the athlete David Hemery, the man who smashed the world 400 meters hurdles in the 1968 Mexico Olympics. Hemery said, when I crossed the line, I didn't know I'd won. And suddenly I saw a BBC reporter running towards me, shoved a microphone in my hand, and I said, did I win? And he said, it's a world record. Then Henry said something really important. He said, it had always been my intention to run a world record time rather than to win the race. Everyone knows, every runner knows, you can't control what other people do. What he was saying was that you should focus on being the best that you can be rather than trying to be better than others. It was a surprisingly profound thing to, uh, for him to say because, as you know, in sport, the intention is usually just to beat somebody else. Henry's focus, his purpose, concerned the one thing that he could control, his own performance. And that should be the core message of a speech. Be committed to what you want to get across. It's your message. And that's directly related to the next element. A in pathos stands for authentic. Though be authentic. The message has to be your own. One day I was listening to a Buddhist monk speaking on the radio about the difficulty he was having in composing a a, a talk he was going to give to a non-Buddhist audience. His, to his talk was going to be about finding inspiration in unexpected places. So he gathered together a pile of books on, on the subject and he, he read through them all, making notes as he went. And at the end of it, he was no further forward. Does that sound familiar? I've known a lot of people preparing speeches and presentations in exactly the same way. Usually they end up exactly the same place as that monk, with a list of unconnected quotes, but no inspiration, not one aha moment. Finally, in frustration, he went and spoke to his abbot, and he said, I'm having all this, this tremendous difficulty, what can I do? I've looked through all these books and uh, nothing. And the abbot smiled and said, you're looking in the wrong place. You'll never find your inspiration in other people's works. Look inside. Look inside yourself and you'll find the answer to your quest. So that's what the monk did. He looked at his own life experience and he remembered that as a young man he'd been a, a keen cricketer. And so he turned up for his talk carrying a small cricket bat and he told the story of some young boys who were playing cricket outside their local church. And one of the boys batting hit the ball straight at stained glass window knocking a hole in it just then the parish priest came out and he saw what had happened and the boys were terrified expecting a, te a telling off at the very least but the priest looked at the damage and he said thank you you've given me an inspiration he pointed at the stained glass window, which had a message, Glory to God in the highest. And the ball had knocked out one letter from the final word, and now it read, Glory to God in the high street. And the sermon felt right for the monk because it resonated with his listeners. And why? Because it was authentic. Now, the late Steve Jobs, the man who created the Apple brand and the philosophy behind it, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and told he had a few months to live. Well, he lasted rather longer than that. But it sharpened the focus of his mind. And he regularly said to himself, if today was the last day of my life, would I do what I'm about to do? So let me ask you this. If you were to die tomorrow, 
Would you want to be remembered for what you've done and achieved so far? If the best is still to come, what are you waiting for? So, Steve also said, your time is limited. So don't waste your time living someone else's life. Don't let the noise of other people's opinions drown out your own inner voice. That's about being authentic. So don't try to sound like the person others that you the person that you think others want you to be. Now, the T in pathos is for talent. 2000 years ago, Jesus told a story about that. It's called the parable of the talents. A certain rich man was going off on his travels and he called his servants to him. And to, gave, to one of them he gave five talents. The talent was a unit of money. So he gave, to one of them he gave five talents and sent him off. And the second one came along, he gave him two talents and sent him off. And the third one came, he gave him one talent. On his return from his, his travels, the first servant came back to him and said, Master, I've done well. You gave me five talents, I've invested it. Here, I made five more. Here they are. And the master said, well done, I will put you in charge of many things. The second servant came along and said, I too have doubled my money. You gave me two talents, I made two more, and here they are. And the master said, well done, come and join me. And then the third servant came along and he said, Master, I was afraid. You're a hard task master, and I didn't want to risk losing the talent you gave me, so I hid it and kept it safe, and here it is. And the master was furious. He said, you could at least have put it in the bank and I would have earned some interest. The man had wasted the opportunity. So for 2,000 years, the message has been to make the most of your talents and the opportunities we've been given. So what can you do and why should you try? There's a widespread curse or condition that I call the curse of talent. And some of you may be affected by it. It's when you have high intelligence or natural ability which gets you good, good results without effort and allows you to do well without trying. Those who have that curse will say, why bother to try when I can get good results without trying? But secretly, and here's the thing, they may be afraid to try in case they discover they're not as good as they thought they were. Some years ago, when the Lib Dems were in coalition with the Tories, I read an interview with the um, secretary, then Secretary of the Treasury, Danny Alexander. He revealed that when he was at Oxford, he did little work until the last moment, and then he did just enough to get his degree. Now, that resonated with me because one day I went up into the attic and I opened the suitcase belonging to my mother and there among the report cards from my school days I found a note from my final year school teacher who wrote to my mother and said this boy could be first if he only did some work. So why didn't I try? I told myself I was happy to be in the top five without doing any work making any effort but the reality was something different. It caused me to waste many years before committing to what I was best at. And you may recognize what I'm talking about. As I said, the curse of, it's the curse, curse of talent when the person has talent but avoids putting that talent to the test in case they fail. Now, my best talent is writing. But it took me many years before I, I, I decided to seek a career in writing and even longer before I wrote my first book, which is this. In my late twenties, the editor of the London Evening Standard spotted some promotional writing that I was doing in the paper, and he invited me to become one of his feature writers, and I turned him down. I turned him down. I'd always wanted to be a journalist, and yet when a golden opportunity was presented to me, I let it pass. And why? Because secretly I was afraid others might think I was not as good a writer as I thought I was. If you have talent, don't leave it on the back burner as a fallback option. Put it to the test. Use it. It doesn't matter if you can't be the best there is. You can always aim to be the best that you can be. 
the number one version of yourself. And that is always achievable. The H pathos is for humility. Let me now return to my sports day at uni. As I told you, I put my name down for both the mile and the half mile on the same day. And I forgot about all about it until a couple of days before the event. Now I was feeling kind of out of sorts and I considered pulling out altogether. But so in the early evening, I decided to go for a run, see what kind of form I was in. So I put on my plimsolls. We had no trainers in those days. I borrowed a stopwatch from Father Leeming and I went out onto the track. It was a grass track and the markings were already in place for sports day. Without even a warm up, I clicked the stopwatch and started running. To my surprise, I felt great. I leaned into the bends, pushing harder and harder, ignoring the lactic acid building up in my legs as I sprinted up that final straight. Crossing the line, I clicked the stopwatch and bent over to catch my breath. <laughs> when I checked my time, I could hardly believe it. I had just smashed the state record and run the first two minute half mile in the state of Bengal, in plimsolls, on grass, and without any training. But no one knew. And no one would ever know. Because on sports day, I was so stiff, I could hardly run, and I came a distant last. A friend of mine felt so embarrassed for me. He ran alongside me inside the track, telling me, give up, give up. And I must say it was a tempting idea because I was in so much pain and rather embarrassed as well. But I've never had DNF, did not finish after my name. So I plodded through the pain and got to the finishing line. I went and lay down to recover and I threw up what looked like coffee grounds. I didn't know it then, but I learned later it was a sign of abdominal bleeding. But after a while, I got up and then ran the mile race, which I didn't win either. It just shows you how little I knew. It was a humbling experience, because my dreadful performance on that sports day was not a true reflection of my running ability. After all, only a couple of days before, I'd run the fastest mile ever, half mile rather, ever in the state of Bengal, and here I was, coming in last. Instead of demonstrating my talent for running and enjoying the glory of setting a new state record, I was seen to be a hopeless loser. However, at the prize-giving ceremony, the state governor commended me as an example of sporting endeavour because I had not quit in that half-mile race. And not only that, the two beautiful Broughton sisters whom everyone fancied came over and let me know I was now on their radar. Age 18, I quickly forgot that dreadful event until many years later when I was training business leaders in public speaking. And two events combined to remind me of that sports day at uni, uni led, leading me to an understanding how our, our own life events can help in creating the speeches that we make. I came full story, full circle to the story I just told you and learned to a powerful, a powerful, powerful lesson. And I'll come to that in just a moment. So we arrive at OPRO outcome. It's important to focus on some objective so that you will know that you've succeeded. I previously mentioned the orator Demosthenes. Let me tell you something about him. He was not a natural speaker. In fact, he had a dreadful stammer. But Demosthenes had a purpose. His father died when he was very young and his guardians robbed him of his inheritance. So when he came of age, he decided to sue them. But his friend said, don't do it. You have no knowledge of the law or the legal process. You've got to plead your case to the Senate. And if you're a good speaker, no one will listen to you. And besides, you have that dreadful stammer. So Demosthenes took lessons in the legal process. Then he went down to the seaside to practice declaiming over the roar of the waves. He filled his mouth with pebbles and he jogged up and down the beach, shouting as he ran. And he developed such a powerful speaking voice that he won his case in the Senate. He succeeded. 
because he tried. So what can we learn from that story? That it's important to have an outcome in mind when you're trying to be the best that you can be. An outcome that's in line with your goal. So now the final element is self-belief. Some years ago, there was a story going around on Facebook about a young lady called Jennifer Bricker. If you haven't come across it, let me briefly uh, remind you what it was all about. About 33 years ago, a baby was born in America and then abandoned on the steps of the hospital because the parents didn't want to keep her. Because she was born with no legs. The Brickers decided to adopt her and they brought her up in the same way as they raised their sons. No different treatment. But one rule always applied in that family. The word can't was not allowed. At the age of six or seven, Jennifer loved to watch sport on TV and her hero was a gymnast called Dominique Monchenieu. She wanted to be a gymnast like Dominique. So her father bought her uh, a trampoline and encouraged her to bounce and do somersaults and on it. And soon, Jennifer was amazing everyone with her gymnastic ability. By the age of 16, Jennifer, with no legs, was the tumbling champion of the state of Illinois. And then one day she asked her mother about her own biological background. And her mother said, you better sit down. And with an ever-present sense of humor, Jennifer said, Jennifer said I'm always sitting down. <laughs> her mother told her she was the biological sister of the very woman that she had admired when she was a child. She was, in fact, Dominic Monsignor's younger sister. It was an extreme example of making the most of your innate ability. And clearly, Jennifer was born with a certain talent to be a gymnast, like her sister, but she also had a huge obstacle to overcome to make the most of that talent. And her accomplishments were based more on her efforts than on her innate ability. She succeeded because she tried. So the six points of pathos are to create a captivating keynote speech focus on a, a captivating keynote speech focus on your purpose, to be authentic, to, be, to make the most of your talents, to be humble about it, and to look for an outcome that is aligned to your most important goal. And above all, to have self-belief. As I said at the start, my theme is because I tried. I said earlier that two events reminded me of Sports Day at uni. And the first was an incident, incident that occurred when I was the winter press officer for Blackheath Harriers in South London. I was covering, covering a cross-country uh, contest between my club and several others. One of our members, I'll call him Trevor, was a tall young man who finished the tough race quite high up in the order, but he looked as fresh at the end as he had at the start. And I said to no one in particular, I reckon Trevor could have won if he wanted. And one of our older members turned to me and shielding his mouth, he said, yes, but he won't take the pain. He won't take the pain. If you've ever been a competitive runner, you know exactly what that meant. There comes a point when you have to, you're have you trying to beat the clock or when a competitor is about to overtake you. You've got to put in that extra effort that really hurts. You don't know where the pain is. It's, it, it could be in your legs, in your stomach, in your chest, in your shoulders, somewhere, but it's there. Your body screams for release. You're, you grit your teeth. You focus on your objective and you tell yourself, do not quit. Okay, you have your message. What's the next step? The next step is to ask the question, why does anyone need to hear it from you and not from someone else? That's about being the messenger. It's about your commitment, your connection to the message. And here's the second reminder of my sports day at uni. 
I've talked about not quitting and the importance of trying. How am I entitled to talk about the pain of trying when the going gets tough? I entered a race that I didn't win, but which brought me the trophy I value more than any of the many trophies I won for public speaking and other things. I entered the London Marathon, and this is the medal I got. This time I did some training, but I just couldn't seem to get fully fit, and later I was to find out why. The first few miles were exhilarating. Crossing Tower Bridge, I was lifted by the cheers of my brother and his family. Six miles later, I hit the wall. The tank was empty, and there were eight miles still to run. When I reached the embankment, my right, right leg seized up, and the final mile took me 11 minutes to, to complete, and every step was excruciating. As I crossed the finishing line in 3 hours 45, I thought I was going to die, literally. And this, this medal represent, <coughs> represents the time when I really, really tried. When I gave it everything I had. There was no holding back, no possibility of doing even a little bit better on the day. Obviously, I didn't win, and my time was only respectable, respectable for my age, but I learned another lesson in humility. I learned to accept the limits of my abilities when I gave it everything. I learned to accept I couldn't always get top marks. In fact, I could have died. I didn't know it then, but I had blocked arteries that would eventually lead me to have a double heart, pies, heart bypass. One major artery was 95% blocked, another was 70% blocked. And that is why this medal matters so much to me, more than any other trophy. It matters because I tried. And that took me back to my half-mile race at uni. I didn't win the race. I, I, I didn't get the applause from running the first two-minute half-mile in the state of Bengal. But I did win a trophy. It was the state governor picking me out for special mention for not quitting. It was because I tried. And that was the real powerful lesson that I learned. So now let me turn to the third M, which is method, the silver bullet. You've identified your message, you've satisfied yourself it belongs to you, and it's something that you really want the world to hear. And now you have to develop the skills and techniques that will deliver your message straight to the hearts of your hearers. Connecting with the audience is an essential part of the process. And the others are structure, words at work, and practice. Structure keeps you and your listeners on track, and the right words help you to create the emotional response to your message. And of course you've got to practice. Using evocative language, evocative sensory language is essential if you're going to get an emotional response. Let me try something with you. Let me just give you a little short, short paragraph. I just want you to think about how you respond to the words that you hear. On a chilly, overcast morning in September, I was caught up in the hum and the surge of passengers exiting the trains at London's Blackfriars station. There's a self-centred urgency in commuter crowds, a burst of rapidly striving people spilling out onto the street, then quickly thinning out as they choose their channels to their final destinations. Despite the swirling mist, in that billowing wave of people, I noticed someone marching to the beat of a different drum. Can you picture the scene? Feel the tension. Now, I'm going to assume you know how to write and deliver a speech. Now, we've talked about the kind of content and need for emotional appeal, but a vital component is the structure. A keynote speech <coughs> has to be in three acts. Every, almost every film or play that you see will be in three parts. They are 
setting the scene, the problem or the struggle or the conflict, and then the solution or the resolution. In Act 1, you set out the location, the circumstances, and the main characters, and you, and you capture the attention of your listeners. Act 2 is about the problem or the obstacle that arises. You remember yesterday when Mike Carr was telling us his story. He set the scene, first of all, by, by, by telling us the environment in which he was working, and then he talked about how things went pear-shaped and everything went down and the, the anxiety he felt about having to move his family again and why it wouldn't work and so forth. And then that act was about the resolution, how they came together, worked out what their real motivation was and what they did and then the final result when they ended up to be the number one such organization within 18 months. So you Act three, you could either be a happy ending or an unexpected one. And so then to summarize, the three essential elements of, of, of speech making are message, messenger, and method. The message is about the significance of your content. The messenger is about your relevance to that message. And method is about the skill that you use in taking your listeners on an emotional journey using stories and evocative language. But remember, your primary purpose in any speech is to bring, up, bring about some change in the thinking, attitude or behavior of your listeners. If you want to bring about that change, it is essential to manage that emotional journey. Don't expect your listeners to do it for you. If you simply talk about your ideas or your events in a linear fashion, the best you can hope for is that they will say how well you spoke. But if you connect with your listeners' emotions and take them through your three-act play, they may shout, let's march! Do you have any questions?